Uh, so, oh, good to know. Uh, I'll be doing the uh, quick introductions. Uh, so we'll first hear from uh, Martin, who is our local Black Hole Initiative uh, postdoc and uh, expert in wide area, uh, wide area because he's both mathematician and philosopher and he will tell us about how do we form black holes. All right, thanks Maciek. So uh, thanks everyone for joining in. This is my first uh, Zoom talk, so we'll see how it goes. I'm planning on doing annotations, so, so I'll, I will do some annotations like this as the, as the talk goes on and then uh, I'll delete them as I go. This is joint work with uh, Nikos Athanasiou, who's uh, in the final stages of his PhD at Oxford and who I learned a great deal from. He is an expert on trapped surface formation, and that's how we started the project together. I went to one of his seminars in, in, in Oxford and learned a great deal from him. So, so this is our, our joint work now that's been going on for, for uh, closing to well, over 12 months already. So the menu du jour, uh, yes, I'm also French, like Frédéric. Uh, we will go through four things, some basic background, uh, some big questions in general relativity, what's not known, and where our work comes in. So. Um, that's essentially what we'll, be, what we'll be doing today. Please feel free to interject at any point. So basic background, we're looking at a space time. Uh, and on this space time, we have the Einstein equations. And we're going to consider the vacuum setting uh, in three dimensions. Uh, in that case, hit this equation with um, a uh, g bar, and you will get the scalar curvature being zero. Uh, since t equals zero, that just gives you this beautiful, simple equation, reach e equals zero. Now, that'll be the equation of this talk. Uh, to have this in mind, it's important. I'm, I'm thinking really of initial data sets here uh, and the space time development they create by, by Cauchy evolution according to these equations. Okay, so this is what I mean by initial data. This is what I mean by space. By, development and then I've got my light cone and a nice beautiful little time light curve flowing through. So what are the important black hole solutions? Uh, well, the Kerr and the Schwarzschild solution are uh, kind of the ones we model black holes on. So these are the expressions for the metrics and certain coordinates. Uh, and uh, a common representation of the Schwarzschild uh, space time is via Penrose diagram. So, so here I've got the uh, asymptotic observers at Scry. Uh, this is a portion of the event horizon um, this is the black hole interior right here, uh, filled with trapped surfaces. We'll go on to that in a, in a, mo in a moment. I've got a spatial slice traversing the space time right here. And this is the white hole interior, which is kind of time reverse of the, of the, of the black hole. Now, um, I'm afraid you're in for a reality check. Uh, I believe you all uh, probably knew this already, but, uh, here it is. Uh, these space times do not describe dynamical black hole formation. Uh, they just don't. They're black holes that all, were, were always there in, in the space time. And the point of this talk, right, we'll go back to it, how the black holes form, will give a description of how we can actually make a black hole dynamically. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, this space is called the Black Hole Initiative. Don't we know how black holes form? Don't we even know that, they, you know, that they're out there? Uh, that's, that's from the mathematical perspective. The answer is uh, most definitely not. Uh, we do not understand how black holes form outside of spherical symmetry. Uh, and this, the work that I've been doing with Nikos is trying to, to work and make progress in this direction to actually make a black hole mathematically uh, that isn't restricted to spherical symmetry. So uh, what do we actually know about black hole formation? Well, in the spherically symmetric case, we know a lot. Um, so in the dust case, we have a 1939 work of Oppenheimer Schneider, right? The exact solution, spherically symmetric collapse of dust, wonderful work. And then uh, in the 90s, a series of uh, very difficult, uh, uh, deep work by Krista Dulu, uh, essentially uh, of yielding a full understanding of what happens in spherical symmetry for the scalar field. And then we have some numerical work uh, uh, where I won't be talking about that, and that's been going on for a while now. But that is to say that outside of spherical symmetry, uh, right, outside of spherical symmetry, uh, do we have any mathematically rigorous understanding of full dynamical black hole formation? Uh, the simple answer is no, absolutely not. Uh, and this is the point of this work, is to try and patch this gap. Okay, current questions in mathematical relativity. So how do black holes form dynamically? I've already bored you to death with that one. Do they asymptote 
to model solutions. That is to say, when gravitational collapse uh, starts happening, uh, will the space-time progressively tend to something like a Schwarzschild or a Kerr solution? Uh, and we can also ask questions like, are black hole interiors more like Schwarzschild or Kerr? It's a perfectly reasonable question, uh, which, which I'll be talking a little bit about. Now, taken uh, in the most serious fashion, these questions amount to questions in hyperbolic PDE theory. Uh, so it so happens, hyperbolic PDE theory is very difficult, and it so happens that all these questions are fully open at present, right? So, so there's a lot of things to work on. We're only at the beginning. Mathematical relativity has got lots of problems on its hands, and things are, are, are looking good. So I want to mention a quick quote, right? So Sergio Kleinemann, one of the leaders in this, in this field of mathematical general relativity, with, you know, uh, groundbreaking work in multiple directions, in 2014, right, in a talk celebrating Yvonne Chouquet-Briard on YouTube, which you can find, by the way, uh, he asked the questions, are black holes real? Uh, you might say, what is going on here? Someone so grand uh, and so famous uh, asking such a naive, flat-footed question. No, there's a very uh, honest feeling here. Um, unless these uh, five conjectures are proven true at some level of, you know, uh, generality, then essentially the, the model, the astrophysics and physical beliefs that gravitational collapse leads to one of these model solutions is pure uh, fantasy, uh, uh, so the mathematicians would think. So uh, what are these conjectures? Well, one is Kerr stability that lots of people know about, right? You take an initial data set for the Kerr exterior, you perturb it a little bit, and the question is, is the outcome still close to Kerr, right? That's a perfectly reasonable question. It's still open, although people think that will be answered soon. Another question is strong cosmic censorship, right? Which is what, I mean, in the modern formulation of, of, of what goes on here, what that really boils down to is saying, what do the interior of black holes look like, right? Are they more like the Kerr solution? Are they more like Schwarzschild? Do they have singularities? Are they crushing? Are they this? Are they that, etc.? This won't feature in the talk. Uh, Kerr rigidity, which is a, a, a essentially a mathematician's version uh, of the no hair theory. So the question is, you know, uh, are the only stationary vacuum black hole solutions actually uh, described by the Kerr family, for instance, in, in vacuum? Weak cosmic censorship, I won't go into too much detail and in the, in the final state conjecture, I won't go into too much detail because these, these are long stories. But essentially the point is that under some understanding of the word generically, right, the question is generically in vacuum, the dynamical formation of trapped surfaces, I'll explain what trapped surfaces are in a second, will lead to singular regions. No need to make that too precise right now. But these will be hidden behind an event horizon, right? Event horizons will form and they will hide whatever singular black hole interior region there is, it'll hide them behind an event horizon. And that won't be, and so the black hole interior won't be visible uh, from the exterior. And the final state conjecture is uh, what uh, Roger Penrose in his 1972 paper called the establishment viewpoint. And what it says is essentially that when gravitational collapse uh, occurs, when a trapped surface, for instance, forms dynamically, then uh, generically what will happen is that uh, things will asymptote eventually to something like a Kerr black hole or, or, uh, in, or generalization thereof, if including matter fields um, like, say, the Maxwell field. So, so these uh, ideas, I want to I wanna make the point, this will be relevant for the talk because what I'll be presenting is exactly in the spirit. These ideas are connected. Uh, and that's, that's really important, right? And so what I mean by that is that if you take these conjectures and you try and prove them head on, they're very difficult. People are trying very hard with testability and they're almost there, I believe. Um, but if you try and tackle these other conjectures head on, it's very difficult. And so what you might want to do is to find a link between them. And in, in fact, in, in uh, wonderful work in 2017, Defermos and, and Luke showed that if a strong form of curse stability holds, for instance, then the C0 version of strong cosmic censorship is false. I won't bother you with the details of what this means. The, the essence of the point is that there is a connection. There's a connection between these conjectures. They're not standalone conjectures, they're connected. Okay, first things first, let's try and make a black hole, right? So, so what do we mean by a black hole? Well, that, that's a long question, but one thing we might like to, to, to form is a kind of quasi-local, um, signifier of strong gravitational regions and Sorry, can i ask a naive question yeah um so when you said the five requirements for like um satisfying mathematicians that black holes exist um i i get the intuitive sense behind all of them except the strong cosmic censorship because why exactly does it matter what's happening within the event horizon? You're absolutely right. Uh, I should have said four. Strong cosmic censorship is something entirely different, and it's not about the exterior. Absolutely. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, so uh, trap surfaces, marginally other trap surfaces, I'll describe what these are. And the point is that already in 1965, Roger Penrose had the insight to, to, to define these concepts and to essentially show that if you have a trap surface, then that will lead to an incomplete non-geodesic. And I'll, I'll describe that in a, in a, in a second. So what, for these pictures, what you should really have in mind is the sphere shooting out uh, non-geodesics. And I've written this equivalent sign because this is really going to be uh, represented with this picture, right? So, so this sphere uh, right here, right? This sphere is actually this circle because uh, I've collapsed the dimensions and these null geodesics emanating outwards are actually represented just here. I've just done that to facilitate the, the, the drawings. So this is what a trap surface looks like, right? I've got a, I've got a surface here uh, and I've got my null geodesics that are uh, emanating from this surface and the light cones are kind of bent inwards because of the pull of the, of the gravitational attraction. Uh, and another way of saying this is that the area traced out by the null geodesics is, de is decreasing. So here's my surface, uh, these are the null geodesics, uh, and the area that's swept out by these null geodesics is going down. Wonderful. So do we actually know how to do this? Well, the first time it was done in, 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 in kind of a, a level of generality that's that's really wonderful, was by Shen and Yao in 1983. So it's already a while back. That came out of their work at the Positive Mass Theorem. Uh, quick note, this was refined in 2001 by Yao. That won't kind of feature here. But anyway, um, we have an initial data set for the constraint equations. I didn't speak so much about that because it doesn't feature so much in the talk. But anyway, the point is that in the initial data set is a, is a slice, right? If we come back all the way to this picture at the very beginning, my initial data set was the slice. So I'm now thinking of the slice. Uh, and, and what I'm saying is, um, this existence result is telling us, well, uh, if, if some mass bound uh, holds and some radius bound for the region holds, uh, then there's a Martin trap surfaces inside. So the picture I have for this theorem is, here's a lovely little initial data set. Um, I increase the mass concentration, make it bigger and bigger and bigger, and lo and behold, suddenly I form a trap surface, right? So this is what this theorem is telling me. You might say, is this theorem, what does it do? Well, recently it was applied by Gil uh, myself and Yao, where we essentially gave a kind of modern version of the hoop conjecture, we were able to show that if uh, some mass associated with some domain exceeds uh, a length uh, bound associated with the, with, the, with the boundary of the domain, then in fact there are trapped surfaces inside, inside omega. So that's a, a, a black hole existence result, but it's not a formation result. And this is kind of key. Um, I've joined this this thing too, because I want to point out the fact that I'm actually agnostic about what's inside the black hole, right? So I've got a region and, and uh, all I need is to know what the length of the circumference is and some uh, quasi-local quantity associated with the boundary. And uh, if this inequality is true, then I've got trap surfaces inside. Wonderful. Second existence result, totally different. We're now changing gears. We're gonna to have to change, uh, change totally what we're talking about. I've, I've included this giant mess, but I don't expect you to read this. Uh, what I just want you to see is that Ricci equals zero, so we're solving Einstein vacuum, that uh, we have some complicated requirements on uh, this object here, which is a uh, chi-hat, the shear tensor, which is associated with how the null geodesics are kind of being bent as they emanate from light cones. Uh, uh, I want to point out this fact, the fact that there is a solution to Ricci equals zero, and it has some, some region of existence that's given here. And then I want to show you that this thing uh, gives me a trap surface, right? So this is saying that if uh, the integral of the shear is sufficiently large, bounded by numbers uh, which are relevant to the existence region, then in fact, uh, there is a trap surface. Uh, important thing here is that uh, the picture of the theorem looks like this, namely, I started out with a surface but didn't have any trap surfaces. There are no trap surfaces here, absolutely none. I send in a pulse of radiation in this direction, right? This was Chris Duty's insight was to figure out how to do this in a way to control the space time and the shear uh, to form a trap surface. Anyway, uh, by having a light cone in Minkowski space time on this side of, of the initial data, right? So you should think of these as, as uh, light cones, then he's able to control and the geometry of the space-time through the, the, the Ricci equals zero uh, Einstein vacuum equations. And what he can show is that essentially there exists a region, it's about this big, right? And that, and that size will be controlled in terms of these parameters right here. Uh, and, and essentially what he shows is that then this surface out here is uh, trapped, right? So this surface here is trapped. And, and this was wonderful because this was the first time that anybody actually realized and understood how to form a black hole dynamically. And what I mean by that is you start with no black hole, 
you put some conditions on the initial data, and the black hole just naturally forms in virtue of, of satisfying the Einstein field equation. So this was, this was a, a, you could call it a, a breakthrough uh, in mathematical relativity. This was, this was a major uh, moment. This was, this was um, 600 pages in a manuscript that's, that's um, been worked on for years since. So how does the proof work? This is kind of a gimme slide. It's kind of a fun slide. I hope that, that I'm just going to try and interject a moment of fun into this talk. Uh, so, okay, so what is, how does it work? It's called bootstrap, right? Um, in, a, in a talk I listened to by Cliff Tobbs, a mathematician, he mentioned the fact that he'd never seen a bootstrap. I haven't either, so I'm not sure what, why the bootstrap terminology holds. But I like to think really as an inverse photocopier. And you might say, why is he talking about photocopies in a black hole talk? Suppose you were wanting to take a flight uh, and you wanted to print your ticket to uh, make sure you had a, a few copies. If you print your, your flight ticket and then you take that version and you, and you photocopy it, you'll degrade the quality of the ink and, the, and the, the, the clarity of the message. You do that again, you'll degrade it further and further and further and further uh, to the point where you'll have essentially no ticket left. You won't be able to read the, the, you know, the ticket info. The inverse photocopier is the bootstrap. It's the exact opposite. You feed in something which has almost nothing and you feed it in and it gives you a slightly better notion of clarity. Then you feed it in once more, it gives you a slightly better notion of clarity and more and more and more and you improve, improve, improve uh, until you can actually control uh, the space time. So that's essentially how these proofs work. You, you bootstrap, you say, okay, let it be uh, such that the solution exists in this sense. And then you, you run that into your inverse photocopier and you improve, improve, improve until you can actually prove that, that the space time does in fact exist and, and, it's, and it satisfies such and such bounds. Anyway, progress since, so there's been lots of progress by lots of people and it's been all uh, the wonderful journey trying to learn these papers. So Kleinman Rodniansky in 2009, Kleinman Rodniansky in 2010, uh, Lee Yu in 2012, Kleinman Luke Rodniansky in 2014. These are all difficult, uh, you know, beautiful works that, that essentially carry on the work of Chris Dulu and, and, and improve it in various ways, get more control, simplify it, generalize it, etc. Okay, so finally, uh, I've got about 12 minutes left, or more than that, 15 minutes left, but I wanted to leave five minutes for questions. I didn't want to run over time too much to eat into Frederick's time. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up soon. So what's the motivation for the current work? Well, I told you before, what we want to do is to construct a black hole dynamically. I want to start with something that has no black hole and make a black hole, right? So far, I've only showed you this theorem by Christodoulou, which gives you a trap surface, right? This is, this is what the theorem says, there's a trap surface. It doesn't give you a black hole, right? That's a totally different thing. Trap surface is inside the black hole. There are many trap surfaces in a black hole, but it doesn't give you a black hole. So anyway, we want to construct a black hole, right? We don't know how to do this outside of spherical symmetry, and we don't, which means we don't know how to do it in vacuum. Uh, and um, we want to, you know, why is that interesting? Well, in particular, we'll be able to see the formation of event horizons dynamically. Now, you might say, don't we know event horizons exist? No, 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 absolutely not. We do not, unless, you know, these are properties of exact solutions like Schwarzschild or Kerr. We have no idea if these things are real, if they actually exist, etc. So, So we want to actually show dynamically if such a thing could actually form. Uh, and in the process of doing this work with Nikos, what we found, which was kind of a surprise to us for a while, is that we actually found that, that in the spirit of de Fermos loop, right, which is what I showed you before, in the spirit of de Fermos and Luke, we were able to find a connection between curve stability and strong cosmic censorship. Uh, I, I will show you essentially how we've been able to, to find a connection uh, with the problem of black hole formation and curve stability. So anyway, this is the dream. Right, Martin Luther King had a dream, mathematical general relativity has a dream, forming a black hole, uh, you've got incoming pulse, uh, you've got a trapped region, uh, you're showing that the future is close to Kerr, you show the completeness of the scry, you've got spatial infinity out here, this is your slice. Um, you've got an event horizons which you've been able to form dynamically, you've got a black hole lying behind it, uh, and, and, and this is essentially the dream theorem, right? So we're a long way away from that, and I'm not about to, to tell you that we've done this. We're, we're, we're by no means not at all there. Uh, but what I'm trying to say, or what I'll what I first show, is why don't I show you what the theorems are that, that we have. So, so first of all, there exists a class of complete asymptotically flat Cauchy initial data. This is just, in, this is just means it's, it's a nice initial data for the Einstein uh, vacuum equations. 
And the future evolution of this initial data gives you a, a trapped region. So you said, okay, well, is, isn't that what we already saw? No, there's a difference here. Before we knew how to form a trapped surface. Now I'm telling you, we can actually form this kind of regions, regions that are filled with trapped surfaces, but that are bounded by these marginally out of trapped surfaces. So that's something that, that, that we can now do. Moreover, what happens to be possible is that the, the Penrose inequality, which was Penrose's idea of kind of like tech, you know, giving a, a simpler problem to, uh, in order to test some of the big open questions I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, right? The mathematicians four ways to black hole reality. Um, well, the Penrose inequality was a kind of elliptic version of these hyperbolic questions. Uh, and, and it's essentially a, a sanity check for these, for these hyperbolic problems. And it's still open in full generality, right? So what we've been able to do is actually realize the spirit of Penrose in the sense of, of, of realizing this uh, formation version of the Penrose inequality. So in particular, we're able to prove the, the Penrose inequality, the general space-time Penrose inequality, in a dynamical setting where a black hole is actually forming gravitational collapse, right? So we're not at all in the setting of initial data here. We're, we're forming the black hole and we're checking if the Penrose inequality is satisfied as this procedure happens. And in fact, it is, at least for an open region that can be controlled by the data. Perhaps most important, right? Most important is this. This is telling us that if a certain form of cursed stability holds, which in particular, we don't know if that's the form that's gonna be proven in the next two or three years. We, 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 we're not quite sure because uh, those theorems aren't out yet. People not still sure these works are, are very long, very complicated works. So, so then what we can show is that well, we cosmic censorship and final state are true for this initial data. So, so what that means is that the, the, what we found is essentially a connection between Christodoulou's formation of, black, of trapped surfaces results and the stability result. Now you want, might wonder how, how, how could you do that? Well, uh, the, the picture, and this stems really from work of, of uh, Lee Yu was the, the main inspiration for this, right? A wonderful paper in 2012, which Nikos and I read and, and really gave us the, the, the inspiration uh, to do this. You, you essentially use gluing to, to, cur, uh, uh, to glue a cur slice, so a slice that could embed in the cur space time, and you patch it onto Chris Tadoulou's thing. So Lee and you were able to do this, actually. They were the first ones that, that, that found a way of doing this. And we found that if we combined their ways with some of the recent progress on trapped surface formation, we could suddenly gain more control on the geometry, especially in this region and in this region. And in particular, we, we could actually form a trapped region dynamically, right? So this shaded region is where all the trapped surfaces lie, and they all lie behind these marginally out of trapped surfaces. And then this is a kind of intermediate region that we're able to control uh, in, in a kind of precise way. And that gives you the slice I've drawn here like this. Those are the slices on which we're testing the Penrose inequality, right? So we have these marginally out of trap surfaces here. So we have estimates for the area. We have estimates for the mass. And we're able to kind of give a, a dynamical version of Penrose's is, is, is idea and, and, and prove, in fact, that it holds. In particular, it holds for this open region out here. Uh, and... Then you might say, okay, but what about stability and all the rest of it and the full evolution and the full space time? Well, the point is that now, because of this extra, constro extra control, we can use this, right? Uh, sorry, that wasn't done very well. We can use this as new initial data, right? This will be the new initial data. And then we can piggyback of the, the wonderful uh, great big works that people are working on in, in stability, And we can show that essentially, this part of the of the right so all this this is in our theorem we can control this region and then we've got estimates for what happens here right and then this actually ends up being exactly of the form uh that's amenable to curse stability so that in other words if curse stability holds right which tells us that the, the future development of a perturbation of curve will remain close to curve then we can combine our initial data set, which is all the way down here, which doesn't contain either trap surfaces or marginally out trap surfaces, doesn't contain any black hole, doesn't contain anything, right? It just has pulses of gravitational waves. Then we can show that the, the final, right, the final uh, state of affairs up here, all the way up at time like infinity, is in fact described by the Kerr exterior, which is of course, uh, when we come back to the, to the final state conjecture, Right? That was the dream of this final state conjecture was exactly this. Right? Generically in vacuum, the dynamical formation of trapped surfaces 
will lead to an asymptote to a curved black hole. Well, what we can show with, with this work is that essentially, uh, with, with this diagram, that's essentially realizing exactly that, right? Realizing exactly the spirit of that conjecture. So, in other words, just to conclude, just to, to, to leave myself uh, a little over five minutes of questions, I've gone quite quickly here, so, so uh, I've tried to fit so many things in. Uh, so, in other words, what have we done? We've constructed vacuum Cauchy data that dynamically produces a trapped region. Uh, this was inspired by Li Yu's uh, ability to do this for the formation of trap surfaces. Now, we just extended that slightly and found a trap region, right? So, so not just a single trap surface, but a, a whole host, an infinite number of trap surfaces uh, in an open set that's, that's kind of contained by these uh, marginally out of trap surfaces that bound them, been able to show that these marginally out of trap surfaces asymptote to something null, which is what, what people expect, right, in the, in the literature. We've been able to prove the general space-time Penrose inequality in, this, in the actual dynamical setting of gravitational collapse. So realizing what Penrose was, was, was kind of trying to go for by this, by this idea, right? Testing these big conjectures with these more elliptic problems. Uh, and in the process of doing so, we found a connection between uh, curve stability, weak cosmic censorship, and final state. And the connection is this, it's if curve stability holds, then you take our data and you add it with curve stability, then you will get an example, a vacuum example, non-spherically symmetric of weak cosmic censorship and of final state, both things that were, that were not known outside of spherical symmetry. So I will stop there. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Comments or questions? Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Martin, um, from a point of view of an astrophysicist, it's pretty clear, at least to, to astronomers, that black holes exist based on all the evidence that we have right now. So nature demonstrates for us a proof that they exist. But uh, my question has to do with um, more the whether every singularity that forms in nature would be dressed up with a horizon. Can you comment on that? Um, do, do you think uh, there could be a loophole where you would make a singularity without a horizon around it? Um, I think you can do that. And in fact, people have constructed such examples. And then the, the, the question is always the same. It's to what extent are these examples generic? Like, would they actually occur in nature? So uh, that's really where that question goes. People have constructed naked singularities. Uh, Chris Tadoulou showed that you can actually form this even in spherical symmetry. And then the, the, the way to avoid this in nature, so to speak, or, or Penrose's hope that this wouldn't happen, uh, is to count these constructions as non-generic, as, as not really, um, not really the, the standard situation, but something more like a very special scenario. But so, is, it really, is it really special? Can, can you find an example that is not so special? Uh, well, that, I guess, I guess to, to fully, uh, so the, the full answer to your question is really the conjecture of weak cosmic censorship. So all the examples that have been produced now, they're all very special. Uh, from the mathematical point of view, they're all very special. Uh, it's still unknown if you can produce a less special example. So we'll see. Thank you. Other comments or questions? How generic is the initial Cauchy data of your theorem? Like, is it cut out just by some inequalities on you know, some, some astrophysical quantities, or, or do you start with some on that's, that's not spherically symmetric and show something about it? So that, that's, a, that's a beautiful question. So the question, just for everyone, so the question was, uh, how generic is the initial data we have? Okay, and that's a wonderful question because, of course, you want to prove these big conjectures, and these big conjectures hold for uh, the, the, they're supposed to be for the generic case. Of course, if you find an example that's non trivial, that's not spherically symmetric, then that's already step one, and, and this is what I'm saying, right? But, but the question is how generic they are. And to answer that question is that, uh, in, the, in the most honest way, is that they're not generic, right? They're not generic because, in order to gain uh, a lot of control, on the space-time, you must assume certain things. So you don't just have an open set in the moduli space of solutions to the constraints. You have to, you have to tune the data, uh, and that is a delicate procedure which forces you uh, to, to kind of assume, for instance, that the light cone here is one in Minkowski space-time, right? So uh, it's clearly not generic in that sense. However, 
uh, Nikos and I were thinking about this and we think that there is a hope for the future to actually prove this in a much more uh, generic uh, version. Sorry, just to like naively follow on, if you take one of your initial data and perturb it a little bit, what step of the procedure goes wrong? Like the curve stability seems to go fine, so it must have been something before that, but yeah. So actually, actually, that's a really good point. The curve stability is you cannot invoke it, right? Because curve stability says take a slice in curve and perturb it. If you perturb our initial data slice, which is out here, that's not a slice that, that has a black hole in it, right? It, it's, the exterior looks like curve, but that doesn't have a black hole in it. When you do curve stability, you always start with an initial data set that ends on something that has a trapped surface or a marginally out of trapped surface, right? So actually, curstability doesn't actually, it wouldn't apply in that, set, in that sense. More seriously, uh, you, you lose control. If you start uh, screwing up with this light cone, uh, then you lose control on what happens here in quite an important way. And people have thought about how to get around this, and Luke Ronianski's paper is, is where, where to look, and that's what we're looking at. They've been able to essentially uh, weaken this assumption that this guy embeds in Minkowski. They've been able to, to, to have a much more generic setup. So if you could carry out you know, this procedure with their insight, then maybe you could find something like a, gen, a much more, uh, you know, much bigger open set in the, in the space of initial data. I see, thank you. Are all of these solutions still within a vacuum, so your T is still equal to zero? Yeah, everything is vacuum. Um, so from an astronomer's perspective, how do you end up with a black hole if there's no mass? Okay, so uh, mass uh, can be very large in a vacuum space-time, right? Gravitational energy is, uh, it doesn't have, it's not matter, but it has, it can have a lot of energy, right? So. Uh, oh, okay. The short shape is a vacuum example. It could have a very, very large mass. So, so uh, let, let me just clarify it for astronomers. It's basically a gravitational waves of energy that he's using to make the black hole. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin, uh, can I ask a question as well? So um, yeah. uh, you just said that your, your initial data is not generic. It's not. No. Uh, that was your answer to Arno's question. Um, I wonder, uh, you know, how special is it in particular with respect to the fate of the strong cosmic censorship? What do you mean exactly? So you, you have a specific initial data set. I, I want to know if you, if you, you know, what, what do you think, uh, uh, what do you think is true about strong cosmic censorship for this initial, initial data? Is it some kind of special initial data which violates it or does, does it respect special strong cosmic censorship? That's the question. I see, I see. So let me clarify one thing. The initial data we have is not generic in, this, in the strict mathematical sense of saying an open set in the moduli space of initial data. However, what we have is not just an example. We have a class of examples, right? They're just controlled by various parameters in the initial data space. So, mm -hmm. so it's not generic, but it, it's definitely a class of examples and a class of solutions. It's not just one simple uh, example, of course. Now, with respect to your question, what happens with strong cosmic censorship? That's a really uh, good question. So, so the only way I could, so first of all, none of this stuff, hmm. Yeah, so, okay, so suppose Lambda is- Sorry, can, can I just, just weigh in here and say that the same sort of question can be asked for the uh, type of, initial data that, that preceded what we're trying to do here, namely the works of uh, Unlook, un etc. So it's their initial data that we rely on more or less and uh, our similar initial data like Unlook, further works by Anne and things like that. So you can ask the same question for, for that type of data. Right, right. But, but Achilles' his question, I think, was more about, like, what would happen, say, if, if like, you, you, you thought of what the space-time looked like here, and then you found the development of this guy in this region. And would this satisfy strong cosmic censorship if we'd start with initial data that looks like this, right? That was your question, essentially. Is that right? Yeah, and I was inspired to ask this question because you reviewed in the beginning of your talk that uh, the firm must look... Um, had the connection between uh, between uh, cosmic censorship uh, failing uh, with respect to yeah. to an assumption of care stability in the exterior, and you're, you you have shown that there's a connection of care stability in the exterior 
for your initial data sets and uh, and you know final final conjecture etc but you didn't mention anything about strong cosmic censorship for you yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the honest the honest answer is that we haven't really studied strong cosmic censorship but my guess my honest guess would be to say uh, it, it all depends on the details of what you can prove about cursedability. So if, if, if the mm -hmm. first two need a really strong form of cursedability, then uh, in order to show that C0 version of cosmic censorship is false, then uh, maybe you could preserve a C0 version of strong cosmic censorship here. I don't know. Maybe if the cursedability they need is very weak, uh, then maybe, in fact, this will uh, have a C0 extension beyond the Cauchy right? But your question is is to answer it in detail. Uh, I don't have the tools right now, and I uh, yeah, and it's not something I think that's easy to answer uh, at, at this state of knowledge, at least. And I haven't really looked into that. But thank you. That that's a really nice question. Okay, so I think we will move uh, forward. Thank you, Martin, very much. Uh, that was very enjoyable, and I must say you are a very proficient user of uh, Zoom annotations. I All have right, to I'll, incorporate I'll, I'll more stop. of that into the talk. <laughs> All right, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, thank you everyone for listening and for asking, uh, for asking your questions. Okay, so I start. Okay, Frederick, you are sharing your screen. Okay, okay can you see the, the slide? Yeah, it looks fine, good. Uh, so our uh, next speaker uh, today is uh, an astronomer, uh, Frederic Vanson, uh, who is working at uh, Paris Observatory, although currently he's working from his home in Paris, I believe. Uh, and he will tell us uh, a bit about what can we learn about uh, black holes um, uh, from the image released by the Event Horizon Telescope. Okay, thank you, Metzek, uh, very much. So indeed, uh, I will uh, in this talk I will try to discuss uh, black hole images or the, the kind of images that were uh, observed by the Event Horizon Telescope uh, last year. Uh, so the work that I'm going to present was obtained uh, in a collaboration between Paris Observatory with uh, Thibaut Pomar, Guy Perrin, Eric Bourgoyon, and myself, Harvard with Maciek, uh, the Copernicus Center in Warsaw with uh, Marek Abramovic and the Institute of Astrophysics in Paris with uh, Jean-Pierre Vassoufa. So uh, let me start straight on uh, trying to clarify a little bit the, the goal of my talk. And I will start straight on with, uh, with this kind of images that I'm sure uh, all of you already know. So I, I'm focusing on the central panel here. This is a, a typical image of uh, what the surroundings of M87 stars is a supermassive compact object at the center of uh, the galaxy M87 that was imaged by the EHT last year, uh, what these surroundings uh, could look like at 1.3 millimeters. So it's a model, it's a theory image, and I compare it with the EHT image, so it's rather clear that if you convolve your uh, model image by, by some Gaussian, you will, uh, you will uh, end up with something that looks like the, the observation. So le let me introduce, uh, using this uh, theory image, le let me introduce a few notions that will be uh, crucial to my talk. So this image can actually be decomposed into three uh, main, uh, three main uh, quantities. First, uh, the central uh, dark part, which is generally known as the black hole shadow, which is due to, the, of course, the presence of the, the black hole that is swallowing uh, some of uh, the background photons. Then uh, the primary image is uh, essentially everything that is emitted except this very bright and thin ring here. So the primary image is due to uh, photons that are emitted by some electron close to the black hole. And the primary photon is essentially going in a straight line between the emitter and the observer who is uh, far to, to, to the right in my, in my plot. And the third and most important to me uh, part of the image is precisely this, uh, this thin uh, ring that is generally uh, loosely referred to as a photon ring in the image. And that I will, uh, in, this, in this talk for the time being, called the highly lensed feature, because indeed this, uh, this ring of light is due to photons that are also emitted by uh, electrons close to the black hole, but that swirl around the black hole that can go one turn, two, many turns around the black hole before reaching the, the observer at infinity. So uh, putting back uh, everything together, 
um, you, I, I, all of you know that the, the, the goal of the Event Horizon Telescope is precisely to detect these two, two features, the central shadow of the, due to the presence of the black hole and the uh, surrounding uh, so-called photon ring. So it's, of course, extremely important to understand in detail what are these, uh, these things and how to define these properly. So in this, go in this talk, uh, I, I hoped to be able to, to have two goals, uh, but actually I will be able only to cover once uh, uh, just, just the first goal of, of these two, which is to try to provide precise definition of uh, uh, this notion, the highly lensed feature. What is it exactly? And I think that the definition that I will propose is new. So the second goal that unfortunately I will not be able to cover, but I will give the reference to the paper if you are interested, is that uh, based on this uh, definition of this highly lensed feature, we try to use this to, uh, to, 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 to discuss the question, can we say something about the nature of this object? And what if the, the, the object at the center of M87 is not a black hole, but some other kind of uh, compact object? Okay. So the goal of the talk is really to, to, to try to, uh, to define properly this, uh, this highly lensed feature, this, this thin ring of light in the, in the black hole image. So I will start by uh, what I would call the, 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 the textbook definition of this uh, of the black hole shadow and, and the photon ring. So let me start with this kind of uh, thought experiment. So we are here together in a virtual uh, room uh, I imagine that at, the, uh, at the, the other end of the room, there is a projector that is sending towards me uh, some, some light, some radiation, some uniform uh, field of radiation that is represented by the, the yellow rectangle in my, in my slide. So I will put uh, an, a perfectly absorbing sphere in between this projector and myself, the observer. I make a photograph, of course, I obtain uh, this, uh, this uh, dark patch on, the, on, on, my, on my sky. What happens if I put a black hole of the same size at the, uh, at the same position as this sphere? Will I get exactly the same? I, I, I'm sure that all of you know that this is not so. Uh, the shadow of the black hole for so this dark region on sky is actually much bigger than the, the, the flat space equivalent of this, uh, this uh, perfectly absorbing sphere. And let's, let's try to, uh, to understand that clearly, although I, I, I'm sure that it's, it's clear for, for all of you already, but it will allow me to introduce a few important notions. So coming back to the, the, the ED uh, thought experiment of this uh, flat space absorbing sphere, uh, now I'm thinking from, from the side. So the projector is uh, on the left, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's this yellow line here, it sends photons toward the right, the observer is to the far right here. Uh, and I put my absorbing sphere in between. So of course here the, the shadow of the sphere is simply the Euclidean flat space projection of the sphere onto the screen of the observer. There is nothing complicated here. What happens if I put a black hole there? So if I consider, um, if I consider that immediately far from the, from the location of the black hole, it will essentially not be, not feel the presence of the black hole and uh, go still uh, along, along a straight, uh, straight line trajectory to the observer. Now, if I consider a photon that is closer to the black hole, the green photon here, for instance, you see that it is very strongly bent, but it's still able to reach the observer at infinity. Its pink neighbor here, it goes so close to the black hole that it's actually swallowed. So it is part of the black hole shadow. This is one of the photons that is screened by the presence of the, of the black hole. And now we understand the first, uh, the first question that I asked before, why is the black hole shadow so much bigger than the flat space equivalent? Of course, because of light bending, right? Uh, without light bending, the, the, the pink photon would have reached the observer. Uh, so this, uh, this, is the, this is the reason of the, of the bigger size of the black hole shadow. So there is one notion that is important here. What is the intrinsic difference between the green and the pink photon? Why does the green guy is able to, to reach the, the observer at infinity and the, the pink guy is swallowed by the black hole? This is because at some point of the trajectory of the pink photon, you see that it crosses a particular uh, orbit of the, the black hole space time, the photon orbit. So the, the photon orbit is a, a particular orbit of, of a black hole space time where a photon can go in a circle, uh, so quite, 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 close to the, quite close to the black hole. And you have uh, the, the interesting lemma that I've put at the bottom of, of my screen that tells you that if you consider a photon that is going from outside, 
if it crosses at some point the photon orbit, then it is doomed to fall inside the black hole. So this is very interesting because this tells us that this photon orbit is actually the boundary between photons that can escape to infinity, so that are not part of the black hole shadow, and photons that are swallowed, captured by the black hole. So taking all this together, we, we, we have the, the following understanding. We understand why the black hole is so much bigger than in flat space, of course, because of, of light bending. But we also understand something important, that the outer boundary of the, of the, of the shadow, the first light, if you want, uh, just at the, at, the, at the outskirt of the black hole shadow, is exactly the image on the sky, the projection on the observer sky of this photon orbit. And this is called the photon ring, which is uh, depicted in blue in my, uh, in my slide. So at this point, we have uh, a first definition of a black hole shadow and, uh, and the photon ring. And it is interesting to realize that uh, both definitions are completely independent of astrophysics. It's pure gravity. And I think this is why this, the, this notion, in particular the notion of, of photon ring, have attracted so much attention because it seems to be a, a fantastic probe of the nature of the underlying compact object. So uh, this is the, the, the textbook definition. Going one step further, uh, the, so, so the, the next step in this direction was uh, proposed in a, in, a, in a very interesting paper by Samuel Kahala and collaborator uh, one year ago. Um, and they actually uh, realized or, or they, 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 put for, they, they, they highlight the fact that if you zoom on this, uh, on this highly lensed region, on this ring of light on the, on, the, on the theory image, you see that it's not just one ring. It's actually, uh, you, you can decompose it in at least two sub-rings, as you can see on this zoom here. And uh, what Gralaital uh, give is that uh, they, they provide a, a clear explanation of why this, uh, wh why do you have these two uh, concentric rings in the, in the image? You can uh, understand that by having a look at the, at the right plot here. So the black hole is at the, at the center. Here is the ZX uh, plane uh, with the equatorial plane being in, in, in dashed blue here. And the observer is to, to the right. So if you consider a photon in black, so all, all these lines are photon, uh, photon uh, geodetics. So if you consider a photon geodetic that stays always far from the black hole, li like any of these black lines here, you see that it crosses the equatorial plane only once. This is a primary photon. If you now consider one of the uh, orange or, or, or yellow photons, you see that they are crossing the equatorial plane once and twice. And now, and actually, and these yellow photons that cross two times the equatorial plane are responsible on this so-called lensing ring, here, the, the, the thicker part of the highly lensed region. Now, if you consider uh, this extremely narrow set of photons uh, depicted in red here, you see that they are crossing the equatorial plane one, two, three times. And they are responsible of this very thin inner ring here that uh, Grala et al. proposed to uh, call the the photon ring uh, and, and that time. So it is an, uh, I think this introduction of the number of crossing of the equatorial plane is, is important for, for making a clearer definition. But the remarks that I've made were a few slides before uh, still holds, uh, namely, this is still pure gravity. You don't have any impact of uh, astrophysics in the definition of this uh, lensing of photon ring. So it is important to go still one step further. So this slide is uh, maybe a, a little bit technical, but I will try to make it simple. So uh, if you want to go one step further in the definition of this uh, highly lensed region, um, you have to, 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 to think about some particular photon orbits in, the, in black hole space-time, the so-called spherical uh, photon orbits. So these spherical photon orbits were introduced by Theo in 2003. So it's not so old, as you can see, this notion. And uh, the, the, the left plot here is showing one of these typical uh, photon orbits. So you, you, you see this photon, which is indeed traveling along a sphere, so at constant uh, radius. But you see that it's not, uh, it's not following a circle. The phi and, and theta motion are very complex. But it's at constant radius. And it's rather clear that this kind of, uh, of orbit is very important, because uh, we saw in the previous slide that the number of crossings of the equatorial plane is extremely important. And when you follow this kind of, of orbit, a spherical orbit, you can cross many, many times 
the equatorial plane before reaching out to the observatory field. Very recently, uh, Michael Johnson, that all of you know, uh, published uh, a, a very nice paper giving, uh, among other things, the projection on sky of this set of spherical orbits of the black hole space. So this is uh, what, what they call uh, the critical curve. So this is the projection on sky of this set of spherical orbits. So how to relate that with the uh, definitions of Grala et al? Actually, it's very much linked because how to understand this critical curve? The critical curve is the image of a photon that has gone, that, that, that lives on the set of spherical orbits. So that has uh, gone through the equatorial plane, essentially an infinite number of times. So what Grala et al. Uh, introduced is the lensing and the photon ring for uh, respectively two and three crossings of the equatorial plane. And this critical curve is the limit when the number of crossings of the equatorial plane by the photon uh, goes to infinity. So I think now it's time to try to summarize everything and, and, and put all these uh, different definition in, in, in one slide. This is what is hopefully uh, illustrated in, in this figure. So on the right, sky plane. And you see that uh, this is giving the, 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 the detailed uh, substructure of the highly lensed region on the sky. You see that it's not just one ring, it's not just two rings, it's actually an infinite set of rings. And each ring is corresponding to a higher and higher number of crossings of the equatorial planes by photon. For instance, if I consider some uh, blue geodesics that uh, impact the n equal three sub ring on the observer sky, you see that it's crossing once, twice, and three times uh, the equatorial plane. So this is, in, this is uh, quite interesting because it's, it can maybe remind you of the spectrum of an atom, right? With this, uh, all, 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 this, all, all these layers. Uh, and this is actually, you, you can understand it that way. It's what I like to call image spectroscopy because all these severings, you can uh, think of that as the ID cards of the compact object projected on your sky. However, there is a very important notion to, 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 to put is that this is a theoretical locus on the sky. It's a mathematical locus, right? If you want to observe that, you need to have radiation in this set of rings. So the flux distribution in this set of concentric rings is not uh, dictated by gravitation, but depends on what kind of matter, what kind of emitted matter you have uh, around your black hole. For instance, if I consider this case where I would have just one uh, blob of matter represented in green here, that uh, crosses the, the, my, my red geodesic, well, my n equal to uh, the red uh, sub-ring would be full of light, but all the other guys would be completely dark. So this is why we introduce a new notion, uh, the notion of the secondary ring. And the secondary ring is essentially the sum of all these sub-rings, n equal to to infinity. We don't care about the, diff the, the, the distinction between uh, the, all the various sub-rings. We put everything together. But we make the very important second uh, part of the definition. The secondary ring is the, the, the parts of this, uh, of this structure where there is a detectable amount of flux. And here you see very well that our notion now is model dependent, astrophysics dependent. It depends on what kind of matter you have surrounding your black hole. So to put it maybe uh, more clearly, uh, the, the, the following question is not well posed. Uh, what is the secondary ring of a Kerr black hole of spin 0.5? This is not a well-posed question. The well-posed question is, what is the secondary ring of a Kerr black hole of spin 0.5 surrounded by this particular model of accretion flow and this uh, particular model of emission? Um, can, okay, I say, so can I ask a quick question, Frederick? Yeah. Yeah, can you go back to that slide? It, it, it almost seems as though some of these paths are starting on that black disk. What is that black disk in the center supposed to be? Ah, yeah, so, so, so this is the event horizon of the, of the black hole. And here I am taking the perspective of uh, uh, ray tracing uh, people uh, like, like me, which means that the, the photons are traced backwards in time. So uh, if a photon ends on the event horizon, it means that it's asymptotically converging to the event horizon. Of course, it's not emitted by the event horizon. Yeah, but, but a, a photon that was traced back to the event horizon would not contribute to the curves on the right. Uh, well, it can if, uh, if there is some uh, emitting matter on the, somewhere on the way between the, 
for, for instance, on this blue geodesic, if there is some blob of emitting matter here, uh, th this geodesic can transport light to the to the to to to, to the n equal three uh, subring, right? Hmm. Yeah, I, I suppose that can happen. Yeah, the, and and actually this uh, uh, this is a notion that I can um, maybe discuss in in one of my uh, supplementary slides that are at the end of the, of the talk, because it shows that uh, generally uh, people have in mind that the, the I mean, in a ray tracing context, the shadow is often defined as a set of geodesics that when ray trace backwards in time from the observer screen towards the black hole, the set of geodesics that asymptotically converge to the event horizon. And I think actually that this definition is not correct because as I just said, if you have uh, emitting matter on the way in between the, 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 the observer and the point at which the, 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 the geodesic is asymptotically converging to the event horizon, then you will have some some flux uh, on the uh, at this point of the of the observer screen. I see. So, so what you're saying is, even if you had a radial point, a radial line that went directly to the black sphere there, uh, you would still get some emission due to the accretion due to the emission that was between you and the black hole. Exactly. exactly. So you might get a little bit of emission in the center. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. So th this slide is essentially here for pedagogical purpose, but uh, to, to make it clearer, I wanted to, to double check that on a, on a more quantitative basis. So what I did is that I, 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 I take this, uh, this left plot here that is for in time in question, and I, 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 I cut it in the vertical direction, and I plot on the, uh, on, on the, the, the middle panel here, the evolution of the intensity, as observed by the, the, the observer at infinity, as a function of the distance in the in the, in the screen, so the, the, the declination for, for, uh, in, in n units here. And the, the right panel is showing a zoom on the, uh, the, the secondary ring of the, of the south part of the image, right? So this is a zoom on this part. So you see two curves. Why, why, what do they mean? So the blue curve is just what I, what I just said. I take a, a, a cut, a vertical cut in my image, and I just plot the intensity as a function of distance. The red curve is the same, but I change the emission by hand. And what I do is that I'm considering here the, uh, the equatorial plane of the black hole. The black hole is here. The azimuthal phi angle is uh, going from zero to pi to, to pi in this direction. And what I say is that all parts of my accretion flow that are closer to phi equals zero than, to, than, sorry, that are closer to phi equals zero than to phi equal pi, I boost them by a factor of two. I boost their emission by a factor of two. So it, mean, it means that my emission is no longer axisymmetric. And then what I get is this red line here. And what is important is that you see that the n equal three to n equal four ratio is varying in the two experiments. So I think this is a convincing proof that indeed the, 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 the image spectroscopy that you can make by analyzing this, this kind of black hole image is very much dependent on the, 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 the emission model that you put. If you take an axis symmetric emission or if you take a uh, 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 half boosted emission flow, you will have a, a, different, uh, a, a different image spectroscopy. Okay. So uh, the, that's all, so I, I, I'm going to conclude now. Um, I think the important notion that I wanted to stress in this talk is this notion of secondary ring. So I have introduced quite a lot of definition. There was this uh, highly lens feature, photon ring, lensing ring, uh, a critical curve, and, and so on. It, it, can ha it can seem to you that, oh, okay, it's just one more word. It makes it, makes it even, even uh, less understandable. I don't think so, because I think that this, the, the, I mean, the, the, the special notion associated to this, uh, this new uh, uh, word of, of secondary ring is the fact that it's not pure gravitation. The secondary ring is the full set, sorry, the part of the full set of sub rings uh, on the observer side, on the observer sky, where there is detectable emission. And this where is extremely crucial. It, it shows you that this is a astrophysics dependent feature. It's, it's not pure gravity. Um, so if, if I can have two or three minutes, this is essentially a teaser because I, 
I, I actually learned uh, one hour ago that I had 25 minute presentation, so I prepared a 45 minute talk. So this is the, 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 the part of the conclusion that I, that I did not have time to, 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 to present you. But you can find everything on this, on this paper on archive. It's, it, it was uh, submitted a month ago. Um, uh, so this is showing you the, 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 the main reason, for the second part of our work, which was trying to apply this idea to the, the real world, if you want, and to compare uh, black hole images when you have at the center of M87 a black hole or something else. And the something else that I'm discussing here is a boson star. A boson star, I don't want to go into the details of what it is. Essentially, it is a compact object that doesn't have an event horizon. So it doesn't mean that it breaks the, the cosmic censorship because it doesn't have a central singularity as well. Uh, and you see that uh, on this plot, uh, we can, uh, well, uh, we are able to show that uh, a boson star can exactly mimic a black hole image. But I have, uh, I have been uh, honest here, I said it, it's an ad hoc boson star that I have chosen here, meaning that I have chosen the inner radius of my accretion flow surrounding my boson star in order to match the image uh, uh, of the black hole. So of course, it doesn't mean that you cannot make a difference between a boson star and a black hole, but what it means is that gravity alone is not sufficient to make a clear difference. You need to understand and to trust your plasma physics to, to so essentially the, the, the property of your accretion flow around your boson star is as important and maybe more important than gravity in order to be able to make a clear comparison between the, between the two objects. Okay, so sorry to be so, so quick on this, but uh, I hope, uh, well, you, you can have a look at the paper if you're, if you're interested. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Frederic. Uh, are there questions or comments to the talk? If not, then I will ask. Uh, so, did EHT see the black hole? Sorry for a very direct question. <laughs> uh, well, I, I get that EHT saw an extremely compact object at the center of a galaxy. Uh, based on, uh, well, it depends what you mean by EHT. If you mean the image of EHT and it alone, I would say that no. If you say the, ima the, the EHT image added on what we already know on the, the property of the center of M87, I would say that then indeed there is a, uh, there is a lot of proof that is going towards the, 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 but as you can see from this image, it is possible to, uh, to, to, to build some alternative compact objects that have nothing to do with a black hole at the theory level and that end up with uh, exactly the same kind of images. So I don't mean that uh, what uh, is at the center of M87 is not a black hole, but what I mean is that it's important to go further in the study of this kind of objects to have a, a clearer uh, answer to give to your question. Yeah, so let me ask a, a much, can I ask a related question? This is Shep. Yeah, so, so first of all, I agree with you, uh, Frederick. One has to look at this in context. For example, an important question to ask is, can an ad hoc boson star launch a relativistic jet uh, that we see from the center of M87? One of the characteristics of these active galactic nuclei, of course, is that they have these jets that can span thousands, if not tens of thousands, uh, in some cases up to a million light years uh, from the center. Um, so one would have to figure out a way for a boson star to do that as well. No, so that, um, that's for sure, and I get that only GRMHD uh, simulation around rotating boson star that as far as I know, uh, we are not yet published. This kind of simulation are, are really needed to try to answer this question. For sure. Yeah, and, and one has to, uh, add into that magnetic fields and how they could be anchored in a boson star and so forth and so on. But the other thing, the other question I was going to ask is, um, is it true that you could have a shadow, but that you would have to have the object be more compact than its photon orbit? So, so, you, so the reason that you don't get a neutron star giving you a shadow is that it's larger than its photon orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, uh, I guess a boson star, other exotic constructs like a gravistar could be smaller than their photon orbit. But is, is that a truism that as long as something is smaller than its photon orbit, it would have a shadow or are there some constraints there? Uh, okay, so, um, well, for, for instance, for the boson stars that we are using now, 
um, the, the, there is no photon ring. So, um, so you, you can have an extremely compact object that looks like a black hole and that does not possess uh, a, a photon ring. And what you will see, if I can just show this image, for instance, this is an image of a Christian flow around a KR hole, and this is the same uh, image around a, a rotating boson star. And if you, you see that they, they look really uh, very similar, but you don't have the secondary ring because the, the boson star spacetime does not possess any photon ring. But you have a central dark region. However, of course, uh, uh, this is uh, this is uh, an analytical uh, this is an analytical simulation, meaning that I put my matter with some particular inner uh, radius that I choose. So I am I am effectively forming the shadow by this uh, by this choice. However, if you if you know of the results of the uh, Luciano Rezola group for a non-rotating boson star, they obtain image with a central dark region also in a, in a, in a non-rotating boson star. So uh, so you. So you can indeed obtain a, a, a shadow-like feature, even for space-time when, where, where there is not a, a photon orbits. I don't know if it's if it's answered. I, I see. So j just to clarify, so for a bo first of all, what is the radius of the boson star? And second of all, you're saying that there there is no photon orbit around that object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, th so the radius of the boson star is something that is not very well defined, actually, because uh, the boson star is made of, it, it's really not a star. It's rotating, so actually it's, it's, a, it's a scalar field that is concentrating along a torus. So as you see, it's, it has really nothing to, to do with some kind of spherical symmetry thing that immediately we picture when we say, when we speak of a star. So the name boson star is, very, is really not well chosen. So the, the, I don't really know how, how to define the, 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 the radius of that. We could, for instance, define the radius of the center of the toroidal region, and I unfortunately I, I don't remember now where this radius is, is located with respect to my uh, to my accretion flow. And uh, on your second question, so indeed there is uh, um, there is no uh, photon orbit in this uh, boson star uh, spacetime because it depends on the compacity of your the spacetime that you are considering. Uh, you can you can uh, construct a boson star as you like. Well, not exactly as you like, but there are some parameters that you can play on. And depending on how much how compact you make your boson star, it can or it cannot have a, a photon orbit. The thing is that when a photon uh, a photon orbit exists around a boson star, there are some powerful theorems that tells you that this uh, boson star with a photon orbit is likely unstable. So this is why in, in our study. Which, uh, we decided to choose a, a boson star spacetime with no stability issue, uh, and, and thus to, to 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 construct a boson star without uh, any photon orbit. Okay, well, I'm 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 just a humble observer, so I'll I'll wait until we find a way that a boson star can make a jet before I start taking them too seriously. Well, so to comment on that, uh, because there is no uh, material that is uh, being uh, advected and uh, falls uh, behind the uh, event horizon ship, then something must happen to this material. So I would actually expect uh, boson stars, uh, you know, in GRMHD simulations uh, to possess uh, jets. I, I doubt whether they would be highly relativistic, but again, we would have to wait for uh, some more serious uh, treatment in the framework of uh, GRMHD to learn about that. Exactly, yeah. Okay, I see there is one uh, question, and uh, let's make this the, the, the last one for the uh, time uh, constraints. There is a question in the chat. Uh, if you could explain better the graphics of emission considering the sigma. Question from Antonella. So, the, uh, to, to explain which graph? So, I actually, I don't remember which is uh, sigma. <laughs> but <laughs> because I, I also don't remember what is my sigma. Where did I put a sigma? Uh, <laughs> for slides searching for a sigma or maybe Antonella if you are still uh, here uh, you can uh, speak yeah I don't remember any sigma image in my slide spectroscopy actually. is the image spectroscopy yes and where is the sigma oh this one maybe but there is no sigma this here, but you have already moved forward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Maybe the side number. Okay, it's, uh, stay on one slide, Frederic. Okay. Antonella, is <laughs> this move. one? This one, yes. Okay. And, and, and so the question is to, to, to re-explain what, what do the graph means? Can you explain better the graphics uh, of emission considering the sigma? Okay, so 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 the sigma. I don't uh, I I don't know what why well, there is no sigma in in, in my uh, in my slide, but I can I can try to re-explain what, what this means. So essentially, what I do is I cut along the vertical direction my theory image, and I represent intensity as a function of delta. So maybe it's, it's delta. So the the so delta is the the the, the distance from the center of the screen, right, in m units. Uh, and then I zoom on the secondary ring on this one, on the secondary ring of the south part of the image, and I compare the, 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 normal, uh, the normal simulation, the, so to, which is represented in blue, and a boosted simulation where I boost by a factor of two the emission of the matter located closer to phi equals zero. So this is a boiling quist phi coordinates in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in my care space time, as opposed to the part of the emission flow uh, close to phi equal pi. And what I stressed is that if you compare n equal four to n equal three uh, ratio, the ratio of the intensity of these subrings, you see that they differ. Uh, this one, the, the blue and the red are the same, and this one, the blue and the red are not the same. So of course, the ratio are not the same. So it means that it really depends on what kind of emission you have in your accretion flow. I mean, the image spectroscopy depends on the, uh, the emission model that you consider. It's not purely dictated by, by precision. I hope that th this is clear. Yes, thanks. Uh, OK, uh, thank you, Frederic. Uh, okay. I think we'll uh, fi finish at this, unless somebody has some last comments uh, to make. Yeah, can I ask a quick question? Uh, so, uh, so, the, so there are, there are these multiple uh, high-end rings, um, but then there's also matter that is not part of the accretion disk in the sense that it is, it is plunging into the black hole. At what point, you know, how high, at what point the flux that you get from, from infalling matter is comparable to what you're getting from a high-end ring? Uh, so, so, this will be yeah so uh, ah, no unfortunately i don't have the i don't have the, the, the image that i would need so if if you have a look at uh, at the paper uh, at the, the the care images in the paper we are we are actually considering that we are actually uh, considering an accretion flow where matter is uh, until the last stable orbit uh, in a keplerian orbit and then it is falling towards the, the the event horizon and you very clearly see the difference between the projection on sky of the, 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 the falling part of the accretion flow and the, the secondary ring. It's, it's, it's really clear on the image. That you, you, cannot, you cannot confuse uh, uh, them. Also, um, uh, the, so the secondary ring itself, the flux in this secondary ring can very well be emitted by this matter that is falling toward, the, toward this black hole. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be emitted further away or whatever. It can be emitted there also. Right, but presumably if I go to n is equal to a thousand, I get very little flux from an n is equal to a thousand ring. Um, so, you know, you call everything here secondary ring. I was asking, you know, what, what's the proportion? Is, is the infalling matter, you know, at the level of n is equal to 10, n is equal to three or n is equal to a thousand? So, so here I'm, I'm not sure I, I follow your point because uh, whatever n, the, the flux of any of the subrings can very well be emitted in this uh, falling uh, part of the flow uh, that is radially falling to the black hole. Uh, there is no reason that at some particular n it would, it would start being emitted at this precise moment. I see. I see. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, so thank you uh, everyone again, and uh, we'll finish with that. Thank you, uh, Frederic, for a very nice talk, and uh, see you next time. Uh, is, is, is this the, uh, much? Is, is this the last um, BHI colloquium for this year?
So, Shep, apparently we thought so, but uh, Avi announced that there will be another one next week. That will be the last one. So the last one will be next week. Ah, excellent. Okay, thanks a lot. There will be talk for, from, uh, from Wolfram about uh, his theory of everything that he published on a blog. Wonderful. All right, thanks. Great talks, guys. Thank you, everybody.